everybody's talking about the president. We all chip in for a bag of cement. I took my bag into a grocery store. The price is higher than the time before. Old man asked me why it is more. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Down to Junior's Farm where I want to lay low. This is the Community Solutions Podcast. Jason Bradley, Andrew Richter, back with yet another fantastic episode. They get better and better, Jay, but I'll tell you what, me guessing songs that you do doesn't get better and better. Well, uh, I I think I got it. You said, let's go, let's go, let's go. Is that Richie Valens? No. Oh, okay. No. All right. I don't, I I don't know. Like I said. It's not the Ramones either. Okay. Well, fine. (laughs) I mean, like I said, if it's not Peter, Paul, and Mary, I don't know who it is. So what, who is that? Paul McCartney. That was Paul McCartney? Yeah. Gee. He was with those three guys, wasn't he? He was, he was, but not in this instance he wasn't, no. Uh, oh, it was him and, uh, oh, wait a minute, that was the other guy. I was going to say Yoko Ono, but that was the other guy. <laughs> the Imagine guy. Uh, yes. Yeah, uh, don't tell me. Lennon. Okay, I won't. Yeah, John Lennon. Yeah. Why do I always think of Howard Cosell when I think of John Lennon. Why is that? Because he announced his death on Monday Night Football. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, if I if if that's true. If my voice was a little better today, I'd do my Howard Cosell impersonation. But it's not as good as my Doctor Phil, so there's no point in yeah. subjecting the listeners <laughs> to one of my impersonations again. Yeah. Well, that is Paul McCartney, and I don't know which version I'm going to put up. For those of you who who maybe don't read uh, the entry on the blog, <laughs> oh, you meant don't read. Well, or that. <laughs> uh, either way, you're not going to get this information. Uh, we also run a Spotify playlist with music that we we stick the lyrics in at the beginning of the the podcast every week, and it usually has something to do with what's coming up in the podcast. Uh, so you can go out there, uh, community solutions, songs from the podcast, or music from the podcast, music from the podcast, and uh, you can listen to all these great songs. Uh, so I don't know which one. I'm going to put up there. Uh, maybe the Paul McCartney. Maybe I'll be a purist about it this week. Uh, there's also a band that I love out of Houston called Galactic Cowboys, and they did a version of the song as well. So I'll have to A-B it and see which one. Who was the do. original? Uh, Paul McCartney. An imitator is never as good as an innovator. That's not always true. Oh, baloney. That, that's often true. It's usually true, but it's not always true. Okay, I did make a bold statement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, maybe you're right. It's kind of like a, I'll make a sports analogy. Yeah. Somebody invents an offense. Somebody maybe copies it and does it a little bit better. Yeah. So maybe maybe you're right. You know, Tom Landry invented the four three defense. Yeah. Somebody came along like Chuck Knoll and made it better. Well, perfect example. There's a song called "Hurt," uh, written by Trent Reznor. Uh, Nine, Nine Inch, Inch Nails. Nails. Right. Okay. Uh, it, See, it, I'm it, still in the '90s. Song. It's a great song. Johnny Cash redid it. And I would argue that Johnny Cash's is better. In fact, Trent Reznor was so well, moved by Johnny, Johnny Cash. Is, Johnny Cash is, was yeah. pretty dang good. It, and it was towards the end of his life. But, yeah, that's right. Uh, um, the version was so good and moved Trent Reznor so much that I, I've heard, and I haven't followed up on this, that he signed the entire song over to Johnny. Oh, the rights to it, yeah. you mean? Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, like, Johnny Cash. It, it's your I'd, song now. Yeah. I'd believe it if it were him. So, Yeah. Fun stuff. Uh, let's get into, uh, do we have to, Robbinsdale School District. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Stay we, tuned because we've got a great guest coming in a few minutes. Absolutely. Which we're going to we tease do. right now. But, absolutely. Um, yes, get into Robbinsdale Schools. So we talked a while ago about this referendum and that they were either going to th- push it through this year or they're going to wait and do it in an odd year when nobody votes in 281 well, well you, a little part of Golden Valley. Well, you know school district referendums time is always of the essence. Yes, it is. They get something now or the school's going to fall over. Well, and, I mean, that's it. I mean, it's time versus making sure that they win by kind of orchestrating who's coming out to vote when. So well, you know, I, I don't want to consider myself very... Uh, an expert on school funding. I know a lot about it. Um, it is needlessly complex, like everything is in Minnesota, whether it's local government aid, MSA, county aid, anything like that. Everything's put into a formula and spit out. And those formulas, you know, at the state have automatic increases. Everybody and EM adjusted into them. And you know that, Jay. We've talked about that on the show before yes. with when we did our transportation shows and, and that kind of stuff. And the 
there's there's a lot of pluses. You know, you know, you and I believe in zero based budgeting because what happens is all of these institutions think they're entitled to everything they got the previous two years plus the built in increase. Right. And one cent shy of that is called a cut down in St. Paul. Right. And it'd be nice if we had an honest media that would explain it in 30 seconds like I just explained it. You know, but but right. unfortunately, no matter where you go, you hear cuts, 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 cuts. Yet spending never goes down. Your taxes never go down. I mean, if they were cutting everything, St. Paul would be have evaporated in the air by now <laughs> if, if that were really true. Now, 281, which let me remind folks here, passed two referendums four years ago. Yes. Okay. A general fund one and a technology levy. Right. Okay, which is their slush fund to, to buy every kid a laptop or something. I really don't know what they're doing with it. You wouldn't know if you read their budget anyway. <laughs> However, that was a 10-year referendum. They're asking for another 10-year referendum this year. Wow. You see, and, and that's the other thing. I mean, zero-based budgeting, what do you need this year? Or at most, you do like a two-year budget, you know? What do you need for the next two years? In this case, the schools, it sounds better because they do a referendum. Here's what we need for the next 10 years. I mean, unless we don't, then we'll come back in four and ask for more. Well, and if there's, and here's the other thing. If there's a no vote, they'll come right back at you with the referendum. They will. If there's a yes vote, I can't come at back at them with a no vote. We went through this last year in St. Francis. Mm-hmm. They they rejected a levy in the spring, and then they came back with the same levy, and it passed in November. You know, <laughs> maybe no vote, need to do, there's no respect for it. Maybe we need to talk to somebody down at St. Paul and see if there's a way that we can add, you know, like with cities, through the initiative and referendum process, you can get things put on the ballot with a petition. Maybe there's a way that as residents of a school district, we should be able to get a no vote put on a ballot. And yeah, I don't know. Referendum. Well, do a reverse. I mean, yeah. I, who knows? I mean, I yeah, a reverse a, referendum. They owe us probably a <laughs> probably a probably have to change a state law to the referendum process. Yeah, well, but that's, that's now that's now let's mean. listen to the, some of their uh, reasoning here. Okay, have now it. some of this has some merit. State funding, which is where they get most of their operating money, yep. has not pe- kept place kept kept pace with increasing costs and needs. Now, let me throw let me put those into different words. We're paying we want to pay people more. We're paying them more than we have. So we want somebody to come along and make I mean I mean state state funding's not keep well neither are my wages. I can't levy my boss. Right. So if 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 your costs are going, we know what, we, what that means. Eighty-one percent of their general fund levy is on staff. Yeah, it's all people. That's what they're talking about here. All this money is going to go right into the pockets of the people. Um, Robbinsdale area schools has one of the lowest voter approved operating levies of neighborhood and comparable school districts, with no data to back it up. Right. So of course they got to be as high as everybody else. It's kind of like. We're not taxed as much as they are in California. We got a little work to do to catch up to them, you know. Um, we have made millions in budget cuts, claiming seventeen million dollars in budget cuts. But we all know what a cut is, Andrew. It's just we're not spending as much as we want to. Seventeen million. Yeah. Come on. That- there's no way that that's true. I mean, they just reopened Sandberg. Uh, they brought yeah, fair. After closing it. Yeah, they brought fair. Uh, Pilgrim Lane. Uh, well, if they, you want to be they, fair they, to they, fair. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Spanish immersion, you know. Uh, well, that's gone over to Sandberg now, hasn't that, it? Uh, or is that still at Sunny Hollow? It's still at Sunny Hollow, okay. I think. Yeah. I think that didn't Sandberg reopen as a middle school? Yeah. Yeah. yeah the middle school is where they have the problems. Uh, back. When Spanish Immersion was used to be at Robbinsdale, that's where it used right. to be, and then yes. it moved to Sunny Hollow. Yep. So, I mean, again, you're looking at a 10-year. I want to highlight something else. It's the average home. It would be $149 a year increase to their property taxes. Wow. 149 bucks. Now, we all know what that means, too, because of the way homes are assessed in Minnesota. They right. take the median price, and they go off of that. So some people are going to get a $200 increase. Some people may only get a $100 increase because of how what your home's gone up compared to the average home. So that 
take that price with a grain of salt. Some people are going to see a, a large, and that's just your school portion. Right. I mean, forget the county, forget the city on top of it. We all know Hennepin County, you know, has never met a spending project they didn't like. So, I mean, you know, this is some, and, and who, there's no guarantee they won't come back in four years again with something else. So do some homework on this, folks. We'll try to put some up of this up on the blogosphere here and out on tweetering. Um, so, you know, and like here's another quote. I want to quote the board chair for a minute, this John Vento guy. Um, we are committed to ensuring every student graduates college and career ready, and we need additional resources to make that happen. I'm sorry, it's not your responsibility to get them to graduate college. No, it's just your responsibility to get them to college. I mean, if that's what they want to do, or a trade school, or an apprenticeship, or going right out into the workforce, but, like some people do too. I mean, that's a whole other conversation about how our universities are broken. But but it's also but it's also everybody's career path is not the same. That's and if exactly you look at it. and if you, you look try at try to make it the same. And if you look at the job shortages, they're in the trades. That's one of the problems with the monopolistic public schools. If this were market-based, they would react to shortages in the job market, and those would be filled in. That is correct. All right. For another show. Ugh. For another show. Yeah, another we'll show. get into that. So you got Just that make to me, look You know, when I'm governor, I will fix all of these problems. I bet. I'm looking forward to that. I mean, I'm I, running. You know I'm running. Let's just Don't know sure. when. Uh, yeah. We got to make sure we can still make the magic happen here, though. (laughs) (laughs) The magic will always happen here, folks. Uh, All right, so we're going to be right back uh, with John Ulrich, who is running for Soil and Water Conservation Board in Morrison County. That's something we haven't talked about a lot, so uh, I'm looking forward to this interview. I am too. I think it'll be terrific. All our interviews get better and better. John's a great candidate. It'll be a great interview, no doubt about it. All right, we'll be right back. Hey, this is Jason Bradley from the Community Solutions Podcast. I just want to take a moment and talk to you because we are neck deep in election season and people are getting their campaigns into full swing. And we wouldn't have it any other way than having you out there in the community meeting your neighbors and growing Team 20K. You know what, though? Some of you out there I know could use a little extra bump, whether that's some strategy whether that's learning how to read a comprehensive annual financial report, whether that is understanding your city's comprehensive plan, we're here for you. So get a hold of us, and we would love to sit down for a consulting session with you. Nobody else in Minnesota does this at the local level. All you got to do is reach out to us at commsolutionsmn at gmail.com. That is commsolutionsmn at gmail.com, and we will sure make your campaign competitive. All right, enough of my yapping, and back to the show. And welcome back. We have with us a fantastic guest for you today, something we haven't talked a whole lot about, uh, which is soil and water conservation. It is uh, a position that there's there's a number of of uh, soil and water conservation districts across Minnesota. We'll get into that uh, and what they do. It is another nonpartisan um, uh position, uh, which is right in our wheelhouse. So uh, we want to welcome to the program Mr. John Ulrich. How are you doing, John? I'm doing real good. Good, good. Glad to have you here. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself first before we get into soil and water stuff and just tell us your background, kind of what led you up to this point, and uh, we'll go from there. Well, um, to make a long, it's going to be kind of a long story because I'm 62 right. years old and I'll have, I have to go through the whole process here. <laughs> well, but uh, You don't have to start on day one. But no, just, I won't go on day one. But <laughs> We're not Education Minnesota here. We're not yeah, well, trying to control you from birth. I grew up on a farm, um, moved actually here to St. Louis Park, lived here for about four or five years, uh, finished school here, and then uh, decided that... Uh, it's time to go to work and buy a farm. So that's what I started doing, and I bought my first piece of property, 80 acres to be a, be exact, in 1975. And then about uh, 20 years, 23 years ago, we bought the second piece of property, which is 280 acres in, in Morrison County. So we farmed that piece of land, and we rent some of it out. But the other thing is, is as far as 
my career was uh, I spent 32 years in the military, uh, both on active duty and reserve time. Uh, some people ask, oh, how do you run a farm and, and uh, be in the military all those years? Well, the thing is, is I was in Army Reserve status for a long time. I went on uh, four deployments overseas, a total of four and a half years. I rented my farm out when I was gone. My wife was patient and waited for me at home. I also own a small business where we designed and built plastic molds and, and mold plastic parts, and that kind of went on the wayside when I was doing my military stuff overseas, and now we're just gearing that back up again. But uh, uh, I ran for House District 15B, and I missed the endorsement by just a handful of votes. Mm. But to, to get back to the story, when I was in Afghanistan, my last tour in 2014, I got injured and I was laid up for about 18 months and I came home and because they have this thing called mandatory removal out of the military <laughs> I reached my 60th birthday and I put my whole heart and soul into serving my country all those years and I actually retired as a senior CW4. I had about five commands and I served on several different staffs and had a quite a variety of different assignments. Uh, when I was in Afghanistan I actually worked with uh, acquiring new property to expand our forward operating bases and they had to be up to OSHA standards and, and uh, uh, other standards that the government has for uh, making it safe for everybody. So worked with about 250 contractors that traveled all over the country. So I mean, I really kind of got into that stuff. But on my farm, I got a mile and a half drainage ditches. Mm -hmm. So. One of the things I campaigned on when I was running for the house seat was the soil and water issues with the buffer zones. So uh, the thing is, is that those things are what I'm very, very interested in because I really think that I could have made a difference. Uh, I think I still can. And then I started looking, when I didn't get the endorsement, I started looking at, well, what other positions I can do in the meantime? So. Then I found out that soil and water was up, and one of the gentlemen that's on the board is retiring, and I thought, well, I guess I'll run for that, because then I can learn as much as I possibly can about all the laws that go along with, with uh, uh, the soil and water department, so that if I ever get, my dream is to be working at the state capitol at some point in time, if that happens, you know, I will have the background to be able to do those things. Plus, I have the experience as a farmer on some of the issues that the farmers have. I've also had a lot of a lot of complaints that I've listened to over the years and some of the penalties that have come along with people draining wetlands and they didn't have permits and that kind of stuff. You gotta face it, farmers don't like to be controlled. They're pretty right. independent. <laughs> they are. So the so the thing is is it's not a matter of trying to control farmers. It's a matter of educating the farmers to understand why some of these regulations are put into place. And some of them are probably a little bit overboard and need to be pulled back in. Uh, I've talked to quite a few different legislators about it. And there, there's plans in place. There, say, for instance, the buffer zones, the, uh, the buffer uh, zones that are on uh, the drainage ditches, 16 and a half feet. Well, when they start putting that law into place, it was actually only supposed to be for uh, Lakeshore property because there are so many. Now, no, John, not to interrupt you, but why don't you explain what is a buffer zone exactly? Just so the audience, I, I've heard of it, but I yeah, actually I am not 100% sure what it is either. But what exactly does it mean when a buffer zone is put in? Well, there's, there's, there's actually a couple of different kinds of buffers. Now, I'll explain the first one, the one that we're talking about. If you have a drainage ditch, just imagine driving along the side of the drainage ditch with a car. Well, from the edge of that ditch, out 16 and a half feet, they don't want you farming up close to it or spread manure next to it. And it makes sense about not spread manure and, mm -hmm. and different kinds of chemicals on there because it washes down and the water gets into the river system and where the water drains to. Uh, the problem that I have with it, I hope I answered your question. Oh, yeah. I, I okay. get it now. <laughs> so, the, here, Our candidate's a heck of a teacher. Yeah, right? okay. But, but here, here is actually the gist of the whole thing. I got 280 acres. I got a mile and a half of ditches on my farm. 
I do not farm that close to any of my ditches. And the reason I don't is because you can slide into ditches in the spring of the year when the ground's soft, you ruin equipment, you can get hurt, all kinds of things. What I like to do is I like to keep those so-called buffers uh, clean where I don't have a lot of willows growing in it and stuff. Maybe have some uh, native grass growing in it. Uh, reed canary grows really well in the area where I'm from and be able to later on in the spring be able to take the hay vine and cut close to the road ditch so that you keep all that vegetation down and it and it's all mowed it cuts down fire hazards uh those types of things but also it's just a better u utilization of your land because you can use that that grass that you bale to feed to your livestock uh one of the other things is and and it was pointed out to me and, and i agree with it too um phosphates in the water Whenever you, whenever you uh, put manure on fields and you get the runoff in there, you get a high phosphate rate. Well, that's not a good thing because it pollutes. Right. Uh, so the EPA actually tests for those types of things, and you get your water tested. But if it gets above a certain amount, what you need to do is go in and adjust your procedures so that you spread that cow manure or turkey manure or chicken manure or whatever it is far enough away from the ditch so that when you have heavy rains, it doesn't wash it in there and raise that phosphate uh, amount. Interesting things. You always learn something new on our yeah. program. Yeah. Let's back up just a little bit. One moment. Uh, I want our, our listeners to understand, because this is kind of a new thing that we're talking about, because that's one of those things, like, it's at the bottom of the ticket, or you have to flip it over, and it's on the back of the yeah. ballot. Or in Hennepin County, yeah. they've appointed them completely. Well, and, and that's it. Hennepin we don't get County, to pick our soil yeah. and water no. quality. Actually, Hennepin County doesn't have a soil and water right. board. It's, it's the only county in yeah, the state. Yeah, they used to, though. Exactly. Yeah. It's a department under... Hennepin yeah, it's County. a big bureaucracy right. now. But uh, there are, so we have 67 counties in Minnesota. 87. Or say 87, yep. sorry. It's time of night. That's yeah, You know I know. 87 really counties in Minnesota. Uh, there's not one in Hennepin County, but every county has one. And, in, and the two largest counties, St. Louis County and I'm trying to remember, maybe John, you know, they each have two. Um, I can find out then. Two largest counties where? Uh well, St. Louis County. They have two. Well, that's such a big area, yeah, too. They I mean, have two. And then the go from Duluth one, to what? Lake Cagatogama at the border. Um, something like that, yeah. Uh, it, it's huge, anyway. So there are, are then, I believe, what, 69 or 70 of these things? So, so there'd be almost 90. Or, or, yeah, why am I stuck in the 60s? I don't know. It you must run, have been Paul McCartney. You're, you're <laughs> adding and you're running out of fingers. <laughs> That's what it is. That's because I'm quoting Paul McCartney. Oh. I'm stuck in the 60s. Uh, yeah, so it, it's got to be, it's about uh, 89 or 90 of these that we have in the state. Uh, and they're all named after the county that they're in, except for obviously when you've got the two in each state, they both can't, or in each county, can't be named the same thing. And then down in the southeastern corner of the state, that one has a separate name as well. That's what, like named. Houston County way down there? Yeah, I think it's, huh. it's Houston County. So, uh, so and, and in each of these conservation districts, they are split up into. Um, Districts. They're, they're split up into districts themselves. Um, John is running for District 4 in Morrison County. Uh, can you explain to us exactly where Morrison County is, some of the s cities or townships that are of note, and then where District 4 kind of is in that? Okay. District 4 happens to be the southeast corner of Morrison County. Uh, most people know where St. Cloud is. If you go 13 miles east of St. Cloud on Highway 23, a little town called Foley, Minnesota. And then you go there. about, because I used to fly helicopters, I can say this. Uh, you, you, you fly like the crow does for about 12 minutes north of Foley, and you'll, you'll hit the border of Morrison County. So, anyways, that's, that's where it's located at. It's in between uh, Mille Lacs County and Benton Counties on the south. Todd County's on the west, right? Yes, Long Prairie. That's correct. Little Falls being the biggest city, I believe. And, uh, and the county seat. County seat. And you got yeah. Piers. You got uh, part of Motley. Uh, just in the county, generally speaking, I mean. Right. Yeah. So. Pretty conser conservative group of people that are there. 
a lot of rural areas too a lot yeah. of townships yeah i'd like i'd like to bring up one more issue about this this buffer zone that i was talking about because yeah. it was it was a big thing that was on my mind yeah, and and it still is uh, here's here's what farmers have a problem with. This is what I have a problem with. You cannot take controllability of my land unless you compensate me for it. That's part of the Constitution. You can't take our stuff away without mm. doing it. I question whether that law is even constitutional. I mentioned before that uh, the original bill that came out was supposed to be for lakeshore restoration and take care of... of uh, soil and water and erosion on the shorelines. Right. And then it came through, when it went through Mark Dayton's office, <laughs> all of a sudden, all the drainage ditches in the state got put on this buffer zone thing. And then they, they tasked the DNR with going out and doing, for a better choice of words, an aerial reconnaissance of the state and determine which ditches were going to be public ditches because you got county ditches and you got private ditches. The ones on my farm happen to be private ditches and they tried to put it into public waterways and I contested it and it's not in public waterways. Mm. So the thing is, is if you're going to take my land, you need to compensate me for it. I'm not in any government programs. I don't do any agricultural programs because most programs, and I'm very, very conservative and I like to be private. The thing is, is whenever you get involved in a government program, generally there are strings attached to it. Yes, and there if are. you say, <laughs> and if you take this money for the set aside program, you can't clean your ditches. That happened to me once, and that's why I'm not in the programs anymore. I haven't been in the programs for over 20 years. And first of all, I went up and I talked to the people in the office up there, and they said, "Okay, I'll give you a permit. You can clean your ditch." But are you in the federal farm programs? And I said, well, matter of fact, I am. Well, then you got to talk to the federal guy, and I can't remember what his name was. Hmm. That conversation lasted about 15 seconds. He says, you're in the farm programs, you can't clean your ditches. Huh. So I took my farm out of the programs instantaneously. I mean, I went right next door to the, to the next office and took my farm out of it. You know, let, let me ask just a gen how are farmers doing? Uh, generally speaking, I mean, you know, you hear. I mean, I'm a I'm a country guy stuck in the Twin Cities. Okay, I mean, yeah, my <laughs> yeah, I mean, my my great grand my grandfather was a farmer, so was his dad. Um, going back long, long time ago. I mean, back in the family farm days. But you always hear the family farm is the thing of the past. You think you hear corporations are coming in and buying everything. You hear that somebody, you hear contradictory stories to that too, that exports are up and so on and so forth. I mean, what is the state of the fam of the, I, I don't know if you want to call it family farm anymore, but you know, how, you got a rural community up there. I mean, how is it doing economically right now? Well, I'm trying to get trying to get the right words for you. <laughs> um, I actually have studied some of those issues. Corporate farming, USSR proved that it doesn't work. I happen to be a firm believer in a family farm. It's a way to raise your children. It's a place out in the country. You have your privacy. You teach your children how to take care of livestock, and when they get old enough, they operate machinery and they learn how to be responsible and know how to work. A lot of the small farms, you know, when I was when I was a young man. There was a lot of farmers, even back when I bought my first piece of land in the middle 70s, there was farmers that milked as, as few a cows as 15. They still milked in cans at that time, mm. and they made a living doing it. Uh, then there was a lot of farmers that they averaged like 30 cows. There's none of them anymore. Them small farmers are gone. So all the grandkids that come home and all that, there's no more milking cows and taking care of calves and all that kind of stuff. And there's some of these farms that actually have 1,200 head of milk cows, and they're milking around the clock. Some of them have 3,000 head. They're, work, they're milking around the clock, and they employ people to come and work there. But here's the risk factor to me is it, it, it's a tremendous. Milk prices go up. Farmer naturally is probably going to spend a little bit more money and upgrading machinery and those kinds of things. And then all of a sudden, the milk price drops down because they get paid by the hundred weight. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, then the cash flow poor. Some of these farms that uh, raise 
chickens. Uh, I heard stories about golden plump chicken farms. I mean, people put these big barns up and they raise all these chickens and they got problems with the manure disposal and all that kind of thing. But when you take the bottom line and, and you take the expenses off the top, they're really making wages. They can make almost as much money working in town. Yeah. And do you want to work a 24 hour a day job and make what people make in town or even less? <laughs> so I mean, we need to look at those kind of economic developments, and 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 I, you know, when I went overseas the last time, I sold my herd of cows. I was fortunate enough; I got to buy another herd back this year. Oh, so that's good. Cool. Before I came down here today, I was taking care of my cows and out talking to them and doing all that stuff because that's what I enjoy <laughs> doing. And I watered the horses and all that kind of stuff. But but the thing is, is I want to be able to teach that stuff to my grandchildren, mm -hmm. and. You know, it's it's just a way of life. And I lived in town for about four or five years. It didn't work for me. I mean, I can come down here to St. Louis Park. I knew where Texas Avenue was. I knew where Westwood Junior High School was and all that kind of stuff. So I found my way to get here. But still, at the same time, it's not a place I want to live. Right. It's such a fast pace of life. Hey, uh, I, I'm with him. Okay, if I could go out and, you know, I come from a hunting, fishing family. We've passed that down to the generations, you oh, know, yeah. me. And, I mean, I shot my first gun on my great-grandfather's farm, and it was a BB gun. I was, like, seven years old. There none, nobody thought anything of it then. I mean, right. it was nobody worried about whether the gun was registered or whether I was had mental illness problems or anything <laughs> like that. I mean, the thing is... I have heard that, that a lot of farmers are land rich. They're not necessarily cash flow rich. You're absolutely yeah, right. Yeah, so there's, a, you know, the the problems persist, but I agree with you. It's America's heritage. Um, you and I have talked about how we have to have a manufacturing base in this country. We can't become a service-only nation, and I feel the same way about the family farms, that there's, right. there's we can't lose what, 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 you know, people went west and they went, you know, to farm that land. That was the definition of making it. That's <laughs> true. And so you know, it's the same kind of thing, you know. So I, I hope and pray that I, I never see the family farm or our manufacturing base completely go away. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm with you on that one, you know. And I remember as a kid... Uh, <clears throat> We had some family friends that had a dairy farm out in Deer Creek, uh, which is a little further north of you uh, there, John. But uh, I remember going out and getting to help milk and feed, and it, it was great, you know. I, I loved that. And it, it's, it's Yeah, I shot it at my sister. I can remember that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, farming is just a really great way of life. I, I'll tell you something really funny. I, my wife and I got this little dog. She was looked on the internet and found it. And the thing's only about, I don't think it's even a foot tall. And it's a mixed dog. Well, I had a blue healer. And the blue healer's a natural herd dog. Yeah. And he was pretty good. But I went out today to take care of my cows. And I was by myself. The little dog comes down there. She took all them cows, rounded them all up, put them in a loafing barn so I could open the gate and put the bale of hay in for the cows. I mean, it was just, it, I sit back and I look at it and say, man, can't do that in town. <laughs> no, no, you can't. No way. They don't like you to have cows in town. No. <laughs> they don't like you to have anything in a town. Oh, that's they, true. We fight everything in town, I'll tell you. That's true. You know, let's get back to the Soil and Conservation Board. I mean, Jay, you kind of mentioned that it's, down the ballot and that kind of thing. But I think we should, John, why don't you, what, I think there's there's a lot of unknown about there about what a soil and conservation board does. I mean, what exactly do they do? I mean, what are their top things that they're out, other than trying to take your land and not compensate you for it? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, no, I'm joking. It's not 100%. That. <laughs> I mean, I, I, don't, I don't want to put a bad name yeah. on, on, on the team members that are up there yeah. because they're trying to, they're doing a good job. You know, and I, I want to learn as much as I can. But those are the, some of the things you asked me why I'm running for this office. That's one of the things that I look at. That's a common sense approach. Uh, get back to what they do. I mean, they have 23 programs up there that I counted today. Today I went to my first uh, meeting up there. It was a board meeting, and it was kind of interesting, and I actually have the, the agenda here with me. Uh, they have cost share programs. 
Uh, remember I mentioned before about strings attached. I didn't see any strings attached to it in the board. They voted on whether they were going to approve it or disapprove it and those types of things. And then they have other programs where they have tree planting programs and, they, and the sale of trees. I bought trees from the soil and water office up there for the last several years. And they're actually pretty inexpensive, but there's no strings attached to them. I just go pay no. for it and I pick them up. And you don't have to sign a contract plant. to no, do it no, for the next 10 no years? <laughs> and, and, you know, there, there's a gal that works up there. I really like her. I've known her for a lot of years. She's going to retire here, and I don't know if I should even mention her name, Helen McClanna. She just She's a great person. Uh, she asked me one time, she said, you seem to be so anti government and I, well i've been in the military for a long time and i like to look at facts and i like to look at the programs all the way through i was a contracting officer at one time so i wrote contracts for for different contractors that were overseas so you got performance standards you put in and those types of things and then you got penalties that are written in there well i like to look at all the details because one thing I learned a long time ago, you take all the available information to base plans, make decisions, and, and, and move on with your, your projects. And you have to know all the available information, otherwise you're kind of going in the dark and right. don't know what to expect. Um, that's, you know, they got the other, the other things that they do is they do uh, wetlands management. When this whole Wetlands uh, Act came out, it changed the course of agriculture. Yeah, mm -hmm. can, can you explain the act a little bit? I know that it, well, it did change things a lot because all of a sudden everything's a wetland. Yeah. <laughs> they and, try to make it a wetland. Well, I who, don't think... Who that, designates it a wetland, though? Well, if, if you... Here's, here's what I've came up with, and I'm hoping to learn a whole, a whole lot more about it. Uh, you're, allow you're allowed to drain a certain amount of square footage off your farm while you own it. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of things that go in to determine whether it's a wetland or not. What kind of vegetation it is, you do a, a core sample so you know what kind of uh, uh, soil there is, and those types of things and why it's holding water. Where I happen to live at, we have hard pan and we have clay. And we have black dirt on top of that. Well, you get a little pothole out in the field, and it holds water. So you go out in the field, and you want to uh, plow through that in the spring of the year or in the fall of the year when you're planting crops. And it's just wet enough so that you can't quite make the planting season. But if it's put into grass hay, mm -hmm. the end of May, 1st of June, you generally can go cut the first crop off of it, and it gives it an opportunity to dry. If the guys can drain some of that stuff, they can plant corn and soybeans through it without right. any problems. I mean, I'm not talking about a swamp. A swamp, yeah. I don't think we should be draining because it'll, it'll change our system. Right. But mm -hmm. something that's small in a, in a field or put drain tile in, I can argue this point all day. Drain tile isn't per permanent. You know, you put a ditch in, a ditch can be pretty permanent for a long time depending on how it's put in. Right. If you put drain tile in, it's going to plug up in a few years, possibly uh, collapse. It can do all kinds of different things. Yeah. So there's some different things like that, and that comes back with the, with the common sense approach to it. You know, uh, you asked me earlier uh, why I'm running for this position, and I tried to explain it the best I could, but, you know... Uh, this is what I have in my literature. Uh, I'm a strong advocate for the uh, people of Minnesota and Morrison County. And that's one of the things that I do. And in agriculture, I support less regulations uh, for farmers to drain wet spots and fields, maintenance of drainage ditches, and throughout agricultural fields. Uh, recreation land, I support uh, maintenance and preservation of river streams, Lake shore and wetlands, and, and a common sense approach to protect, protect soil and water from pollution and flooding. My particular farm, I got a mile and a half of ditches on it. Other people over the years, and you got to remember, I was gone for a few years, and I had my farm rented out. Other people upstream from me got permits, and they went and dr cleaned their ditches out and stuff. And then now, if we happen to get a rain where it's two inches or more, it floods a couple of my fields and floods my neighbor out, too. So we got a project that we're working on <laughs> to be able to work with a county ditch, which I've already talked to them about. 
it's about a mile long stretch that actually cannot take the overflow floodwaters and it takes time to go off. Well, if you have th something planted in those fields that I'm talking about, mm -hmm. a couple of t two, three day time, it drowns crop out and you've lost it. So if we can go in and we can, we can clean a new ditch, go through the Army Corps of Engineers to get an okay to, to straighten it out and just make it a good drainage project. And what we, what we did is a, a number of us neighbors have got together and we want to do a cost share thing on it rather than having the county come and do it. I talked to the county engineer about it and he said, that sounds like a good thing. It'll save us over a hundred thousand dollars if we do it ourselves wow and, and it's a project to get the community to work together and it's going to cost us a total of about eight thousand dollars to do it so mm -hmm. we're all going to chip in to do this we still have to get some approvals to it and that kind of stuff but this is what i'm hoping to be able to mitigate being on the board for other farmers to be able to do the same kind of thing we're talking about floodwaters we're talking about ditches that don't that don't take the, they don't have the capacity to do what they used to do because other people have either tiled into them or drained or, or ditched into them, mm -hmm. and then it hurts us downstream. What they normally do is if enough people complain, the county will actually put it out on bids, and then they'll have a contractor come in and do it, and then it's charged back on your assessment, yeah, on your taxes. Say, we, know, we know that's not cheap. <laughs> no, it's not cheap. And, and I actually went and got some estimates so that I had, I had food for thought to be able to mitigate the process. Um, and that's why I say $8,000 for us versus $100,000 put on our taxes, which none of us want that to happen. But that's quite a disparity. It is a big disparity. <laughs> but, you know, it takes money to run these large organizations. We were doing it with very low overhead, where these other com companies have high overheads. I don't know if the county makes money on it or not, but I would imagine somewhere along the line they've got to cover their operating costs and those types of things. So that's why the tax goes up. And I'd like to see some of that at a minimum. Right. And here, here's, this is something really simple, too. Uh, and I'm changing gears here a little bit. But I had several people ask me about regulations to stop cattle from going across drainage ditches or across a stream. That's no different than deer going across a stream. But let, let me uh, uh, tell you exactly what I'm thinking. I think there should be a regulation if you got 3,000 head of cows that you're walking across the river. Right. That <laughs> makes a big difference. I mean, that's something that's not normal. But us small guys has got 25, 30 cows, and they don't all walk across a, a ditch at one time. We should be able to do that. Minnesota yeah. Pollution Control Agency said that they can't control the farmer from doing that. But I do believe that if you have a large herd, they it will pollute the water. So we need to maybe do something about that. But that also comes into common sense management for the farmer. Mm -hmm. And he should be willing to do that. For one thing, you put that many cows through a ditch like that, they're going to tear up the ditch banks, stomp it all up. Pretty soon your ditch isn't going to work anymore, and then you got to go get a permit to, to be able to clean the ditch. So uh, that's why I'm talking about the common sense approach. Right. I did I did mention I seen a, a really neat photo. I went to... A, uh, a town hall meeting that was up in Swanville, and what it was is the Soil and Water Office out of Morsa County, and Minnesota Pollution Control Agency was there, and it was about, I'm just estimating, there probably about 50 residents that were there. Most of them were Lakeshore property people, but the Soil and Water Office was putting out the test data for different streams and lakes and all those kinds of things, and all but two of theirs up there were all in compliance, which was a, was a good thing. So now they're working on a project to clean up those two small waterways. So the soil and water, they do all the testing? Uh, the that I, I can't answer that okay. question because I haven't dealt with it you know, firsthand. Mm -hmm. I'm just going by what they put out in the meeting. Uh, well, is, still only two. That's pretty good batting average. Well, that's what there? I think, yeah. too, because, you know, it, a lot of our water is in compliance. Mm -hmm. The ones that are out of, out of 
the specifications, what they should be, we should do something about it. And a lot of that just goes back to common sense approach and management. Um, there could be other things involved. I mean, sewage and all that type of stuff is a little different category than agriculture stuff. But it puts phosphates into the water. Right. So um, they do a pretty good job up there. I mean, I was really impressed when I went to the meeting today. Um, I was surprised that they had so many programs that they were involved with. Uh, they were talking about grants and all those types of things. And some of that money that's allocated out is done by vote through the board. And some of the management stuff is done through the board. But this is like anything else. You get a new job, you're not going to know it all to start with. And I'm not trying to say that I know it all, right. but I'm willing to learn it all. Well, and we found even when people are newly elected to city council positions and things like that, that some of the most common feedback we get is, I wish that I had known blank. <laughs> oh, know? exactly. Yeah. Well, you can't know everything. I mean, that's just... Well, I kind of know a, quite a bit of stuff that, that I've been talking about. Like I said, the buffer thing is a, a, a big issue for me because I, I feel that it's unconstitutional. They may change my mind once I get there. It's common sense, looking at what works best. Right. And it's got to be within constitutional limits also. Common the, sense, pro protecting private property rights. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And then here's the other thing. There's another buffer out there that people get confused about around military installations. Fort Riley, Kansas has it. And it's a government-funded program that, that for a buffer like three miles around the outside circumference, around the outside of a military installation where they don't want to have commercial buildings and all that kind of stuff. So what they're doing is they're paying those farmers and those people that live there not to build these kinds of buildings. Hmm. Well, the thing is, and there's strings attached with it. Well, of course. So <laughs> that was my if, next question. If that's, <laughs> but here, you know, I sat back and listened to all this stuff when I was at Fort Riley, Kansas, and we're looking at some property to buy for a veterans program down there, and it's like, this don't make sense. Why didn't they just go through planning and zoning and just zone it that you can't have commercial property close to a military installation when it's all agricultural property to start with? So I don't understand the thing. It's almost like a government take control of the property, and it doesn't need to be that way. Uh, yeah, rezone it stays in private hands. Exactly, right. and that's the way it should be. I don't think... You know, we've got, we've got some nice national parks. We have a lot of those kinds of things. But if you start looking at how much land the government owns, it's how much a should ton. they own? Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, you, it's a ton when you take federal, state, local combined. I mean, the federal, oh, exactly. gov federal yeah. government owns 28% of the land in the nation. But that is a, they're not the only form of government. Right. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's state. It's, and I'm not saying it should be zero. That's not what I'm saying either. But I'm saying, you know, there was a time where we wanted to get land into private hands. Now it seems like we're going to the reverse of that, that, you know, we're, we're um, putting land back on the public uh, domain right you or, would be surprised i wouldn't that. be <laughs> how, mu how much land I'm, in nevada and utah oh, belongs to the government how about alaska exactly. yeah. isn't it high there too i'm not sure about alaska uh, well it seems like uh the whole northern uh who owns anwar and all that that nobody can touch it's pristine right yeah uh, it's tremendous. I mean, I you know I, I've said before, went to Yellowstone on my honeymoon. Okay, that's half of Wyoming is government owned land. I mean, you, yeah. and I'm not saying it should be none. I mean, love Yellowstone Park, love uh, the Glacier National Park, which is east of that, and a few other things. But I mean, you know, does it have to be that high? Yeah, I don't think it does. Uh, we, we could do a podcast on how that started, too, yeah, back absolutely. under Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah that's true. Um, that, that brings up a great question, though, because working 
for soil and water conservation. You know, you're your own autonomous group, but you know, you're at a county level. But there has to be a lot of coordination, I imagine, with not only the county government, but also the state government, uh, including the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, DNR, including the DNR, um, the federal government with the EPA. How does all that work? Who are there places where maybe you wield a little bigger hammer than the EPA might, or does the EPA have a lot of rules that it's just like, this is what you're doing. You need to enforce it. Uh, and is there a lot of chafing between like the farmers and, and a lot of that stuff that comes down from outside of the County? Well, it, it's hard to say, like I said, I never, I haven't worked in this position before, but, uh, looking at it logically, uh, EPA has their rules and regulations. Soil and water has theirs. Uh, Sometimes those differences need to be mitigated, and you got to comply with laws of the land. If the law is not appropriate, that's why we have legislators to go in and make changes to it, right. such as this buffer thing. Uh, I think this buffer thing should have been an educational process for the farmers and get them to comply without forcing them to comply. When I was in the meeting this morning, I overheard them saying that they're gonna start inspecting now to see how many farmers are in compliance. So hmm. if they're, uh, it, it's interesting to see what's gonna happen if they feel they're not in compliance. Are they gonna get fined? Are they gonna be, are they gonna send somebody out to trim the the brush in the ditches and all that kind of stuff and set it all up and seed it the way they want to. This law was so goofy, it even said this is the seed mixture you have to plant for the grass. Wow. <laughs> and, and it's baloney. I talked to the, the county engineer, which was actually the noxious weed control guy for the county. This was two years ago. We know he all said, about weed control yeah, around here. He said... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Reed canary is not a noxious weed. Well, it happens to grow wild and really good in the area where I live at because that grows a little bit better in wetter land and those types of things. And I told you what kind of soil we had. We got, got hard pan and clay and a little bit of topsoil and it plows really hard. We got a lot, a lot of rocks in places, but reed canary where the water stands a little bit, it'll grow. When it dries, you can go in and cut it. The, the protein level of that, if you cut it at the right times, is almost as good as any hay you can buy. Wow. So, mm. and it'll keep coming back year after year after year. Mm. Well, the, and, and I don't know, maybe, maybe there are some examples you can think of, uh, like individual farmers and how they've kind of butted heads with maybe the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency or something. But if, if you run into that, I mean, what, what do you anticipate doing? Because, because like, you're over all of Morrison County, and both Piers and um, Royalton are part of the Minnesota Green Step Program, right. which is implemented <laughs> by uh, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Right. It's radical environmentalism. Uh, where do you feel that there's an overreach? How how do you anticipate handling that? Well, if I if I have the opportunity to do that, and I would try to influence the other board members that we need to mitigate it. And I believe that's what they do now. I mean, sit and debate it, the pros and cons, how we can make adjustments to make it compliant. And there's different levels of it. Um, so basically, gather all the information, all the facts, put it down. Here's the end result. What is the course of action we're going to take to be able to get there? And is the farmer going to be compliant is he going to get his permit for uh, expanding his dairy herd to X number of head uh, because they are concerned about manure disposal. So sometimes they have it where you have to cement it out because it's sand or certain types of dirt. Um, I believe they wanted to have like a nine month storage area for manure so that they could put it in the field and knife it in at certain times of the year and that type of thing. Right. Um, but on small operations like the small family farm we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. I mean, I'll have about 50 cows when I get done. And 
all that 40 acres of pasture. I mean, it's a quarter mile square. Yeah. And there's no no ditch in it, and there's no lakes in it or anything. So I'll feed them in portable bunks like I've done in the past, so I don't have to haul a manure out. And it's more of a natural process of doing it. Not everybody can do that, but that's one way of doing it. So but, you can do it that way and be left alone. <laughs> well, that's, yeah, because I went in to ask about a building permit not too long ago. It isn't just soil and water. I went in and asked for a building permit not too long ago, and they said, well, you know, you got these two wet spots in the field. We're going to have to come and inspect it. What do you mean you got to come and inspect it? I mean, it just it kind of frustrated me a little bit. When I moved up to Morrison County in 1977, I went and got a building permit to build a building on my 80-acre piece of land I had. I went to the township clerk, and I paid $10. When I went up there to see if I get a building permit to put a well in and put, put uh, a machine shed up and make it so that two of my sons could move a double-wide trailer house on one of the 40s that I own, it was going to cost me over $900 with permits and inspections and it's no different for me than it was in 1977 so here i'm paying all this money for what and then they're going to come and tell me what i can do and what i can't do okay give me the parameters and i'll stick within the parameters i just like to be left alone yeah and there's a lot there's a lot of farmers that are that way yeah i mean i was going to say you you mentioned hearing concerns and complaints from farmers are there a lot of complaints like that are there um you know uh what what I mean, what can you share with the audience of what conversations you've had with people well, about about issues that they're concerned about well some of the issues are say a lot of times if you got some marginal wetland and it's in between the road and a field that you actually work. And if you, if you want to put a building site in or if you want to be able to get back to that field to work, you might want to put a, a driveway in across an area. I'm talking about a short distance, a couple hundred feet, that type of thing. They, get, they, they go through the process and get an inspection and do all that stuff. It costs them money for the inspection. Mm. And then they say, well, no, you can't do this. And they get really frustrated. So they try to, a lot of times... Farmers are farmers. Some of them are outlaws. I mean, yeah. the thing is, yeah. they're going to go... They pay the money and they say no. <laughs> yeah. Well, sometimes they think uh, to ask for forgiveness is better than asking for permission sometimes. And that is the case sometimes. But they do have the ability to find people for wetland, destroying wetlands. Hmm. But that goes back to the common sense approach. That, that is some of the complaints I've heard from the farmers. Some of it is draining small wet spots in field. I got this one little piece on a 40-acre piece of land that's about a third of an acre. So I should be able to drain it, be able to plow all the way through it. I can get through it during the su- summer months, cut the hay off of it and stuff. <clears throat> and I haven't asked for a permit, so I don't know if they're going to turn me down or not, even though I might be a board member, which it looks like I will be. <laughs> I mean, I'll have a little bit of influence over it, but you know what? Here's comes back. It needs to be fair. Everybody needs to be treated the same. If I happen to be a board member and go in and want to get a permit to do something, I should be treated no different than anybody else. And that's that's some of the complaints I heard. But personalities are personalities. If you come in and you're harsh and you demand something, sometimes people are just going to back off and say, hey, wait a minute, no, you can't have this. If you go in and be halfway decent about it and explain exactly what you want, or don't, don't try to pull a wool over somebody's eyes. They'll try to help you get through the process and get you what you need to do. Well, I'm glad to hear him say that because, you know, we have a Congress and a legislature that pass laws and exempt themselves. Oh, yeah. So it's good to hear that a judge should be treated no differently than anybody else. Well, I honestly believe that. And, I, and, and I'll even step out a little bit further. I've watched Congress and, and the Senate. I think there should be some insider trade laws to go along with some of those positions. And how do you get rich as a politician? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm asking right. a question because... <laughs> they all become lobbyists afterward. Well, That's part of it. They all make their own packs now and, uh, you know, yeah, it's, they, they, get, they lend their name to something. It's almost like they become a brand, you know? Yeah, you know, you look at Jimmy Carter. 
Jimmy Carter's not an extremely rich man. No. And the thing is, is he wasn't involved in any of that kind of stuff. Uh, Harry Truman was the same kind of person. Hmm. If I was in one of those positions, I wouldn't have any annuities. I wouldn't have any thing in the stock market because I wouldn't want to be accused of it. But insider trade is against the law, and it should be against the law for everybody. Hmm. Especially the people who make the law. Yeah. <laughs> You know that uh, <laughs> you, know, you got me kind of sidetracked here a little bit. You know, and I'll talk. A little I bit do of, that sometimes. Yeah, I'll, <laughs> I'll I'll talk a little bit about uh, President Trump. He says he wants to drain the swamp. Well, I believe in draining the swamp too. I don't like corruption. I seen a lot of it when I was in my my military career. I seen it between contractors. I seen it between people within the military. I seen a lot of fraud, abuse, and a waste. And I just think that we need to put. A halt to it and we need to do whatever we can if somebody's out of line they've done something we need to get rid of them and the people need to vote them out i mean it just doesn't happen i mean it's just unbelievable what goes on in politics yeah so it is and, and this here this water board it's a real low level non-political position i'm hoping to make a lot of friends doing it and have a common sense approach and I really think I can make a difference. But I want to get educated. I want to know everything there is to know about this. Every one of the jobs that I had in the military, I was pretty much an expert at. And that might sound kind of arrogant. But they hey, got a rule. Muhammad Ali once said, if it's a fact, you ain't bragging. Well, <laughs> that, might, that might be so. But, you know, <laughs> they, they had a rule there where it says, learn the job of the guy ahead of you. Teach your job to the guy below you. And that's how I feel about life. I mean, I try to teach my kids what I know, and I try to learn the job of the guy ahead of me. Right now, there is nobody ahead of me. My folks are all gone and all that kind of stuff. But in these kinds of positions, you need to do the best job you possibly can, make it fair, make a difference, make a change when you can, and try to educate people to be able to work well together. A lot of times, it's just communication skills. And... I hope that I can do really good at that. So, and, you know, going back, you would asked me a little bit about my background. You know, I went to college for a long time. Army told me I had to have college education to be a helicopter pilot. I wanted to be a helicopter pilot so bad, it was just unbelievable. So I went to Noka Hennepin Technical College for two years. I went to St. Cloud State for two years. I went to uh, Emeryville Aeronautical University for two years. And now I'm a registered student at the University of South Dakota studying political science and criminal justice. I want to be a technical expert in my career field. And that's the way I've always tackled everything that I've done. Um, I was a what they called an aerial observer, a scout. So I got, I got the opportunity to fly OH-58 helicopters. The best time of my life. But it, it's short term. I took a helicopter ride once at Paul Bunyan Land. It was amazing. I tell you what, that's yeah. pretty impressive. I, I, I it was kind of like me when I was in school. You know, high school, for example, yeah. best seven years of my life. It was great. <laughs> yeah. So I was in school for a long time. Oh, and, and I'm always one of these analytical guys. I mean, it says, "Well, you drain wetlands." Well, wait a minute. What's the criteria for a wetland? What kind of subsoil is there? What kind of plants are growing there? Did you really violate anything other than a section on a map that says it's wetland? Yeah, you mean you can't just point to a swamp and say that's a wetland? <laughs> <laughs> well, a swamp is pretty easy to determine. But well, that's I'm talking true. <laughs> about like in a farm field or something like yeah. that. And, and it takes some of that discretion, just like it does in law enforcement. You have to make that decision and be able to look at stuff. Now, as a board member, I don't know if I'm going to be able to make those decisions, but I honestly think that I'll have a voice if I think somebody's getting a bad deal. And I think everybody should be treated equally. One farmer comes in and he wants to put drain tile in. Next farmer, quarter mile down the road, same kind of field, same environment, wants to put drain tile in. One gets a permit, the other one doesn't something wrong there that's right. ridiculous yeah, and i'm not i'm not accusing anybody at that office up there of doing that but i've heard those kinds of complaints yeah 
actually my experience with those folks up there outside the federal guy up there has been a really great experience. I mean, I just go in and be honest with them, so I'm exactly what I want to do. Okay, that's fine. In fact, they have the ability sometimes to waive costs for inspections or permits, those kinds of things. I wanted to clean a certain segment of my ditch when I came back from overseas, and I was told, well, you just came back from overseas. We can waive your cost for, for your permit. Wow. So, I mean, the people are good people. Hmm. I just don't like the federal laws, and I don't like some of the state laws. And I have talked pretty much in depth with uh, uh, quite a few of the legislators in Minnesota. Uh, there's other projects that I'm working on that are outside of this child protection agency, uh, child protective services and social services. And I, would, I just recently, in the last... 11 months I've been a mediator between a family and social services. That family is actually getting their children back wow, on the 4th great. of October. Hmm. And you know what? That's just the greatest feeling to be able to help people become better people. And that's basically what I want to try to do in this position here. And we'll see how I do in that four year term because I got other ideas. I want to go other places. Well, serving is, is you know, it. it I think when people are true servants, it it goes outside of just working in politics, and you see oh, it crop up in other yeah. places. And so, we wish you the best of luck, and we're thankful that you came in and talked to us. We'll have to check up with you and see how things are going. Oh, definitely. Uh, just for uh, everybody out there, why don't you give us your web address again, and uh, how they can help you get a lawn sign, uh, help you with lit, donate, all of that stuff. Oh. Well, I got a website that's uh, www.johnulrich, J-O-H-N-U-L-R-I-C-K.com. I can use that website for anything. I also have a Facebook page. I also have an additional Facebook page that says John Ulrich for a better Minnesota. And there's PayPal stuff set up for that. I've gotten some people that's helped me doing lit drops. We've got about 27 little towns in, in Morrison County, and I think we've got a sign in every town. <laughs> we've given out about 4,000 pieces of literature. There's about wow. 75,000. It's got to be a lot orders. of land to cover out there with the <laughs> an entire county. Yeah, he needs but, help. But here's, here's yeah. what you've got to remember. You guys living down here at St. Louis Park, if you were going to drive from here over to, I'm trying to think of the name of it. It used to be a Target store over there on Highway 7. What, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What's that shopping plaza called? Norwood. Norwood, yeah. Yeah, Norwood Plaza. If you're going to go from here over to Norwood Plaza, it'd probably take you 15 or 20 minutes. Me out in the country, I can almost drive from one end of the county to the other 30. Yeah. So, I mean, because we can drive highway speeds and we've got blacktop yeah. roads and that kind of stuff. We don't have the heavy traffic like you have down here, except on the weekends when people come up to go to the lakes. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 That's kind of a neat thing, watching everybody go back and forth. But Glad you think so. There are a lot of people that uh, don't think it's so neat that live. As long as state. they <laughs> abide by the rules, hey. and, and as far as the laws of the speed laws and those kinds of things, because I'm a safety-conscious person, yeah. and they don't throw trash in my road ditch, I don't care what they do. That's I good. mean, that's their life. Yep. I love going up in that area yeah, and too. further north or west or anywhere except the seven county metro. <laughs> except I always say, I always like to go north. Yeah. You know, my wife and I are big campers, and I always say, if you don't drive 50 miles out of the city, you ain't camping. Yeah. So that's just, I think I made that up. <laughs> anyway, well, thank I, you, John. And yep, yeah, go ahead. I was hoping to say one more thing. Sure. So, you know what? I'm from Morrison County. This position I'm running for, the only people that can vote for me are residents of Morrison County. So, please, I ask for your vote. I don't have to have all your money and all those kinds of things. In November, I'll be on the ticket there. And I do believe that I can make a difference. Yeah, and that's important to note. If you're in Morrison County, you can vote for John. Even though he's representing District 4, anyone in Morrison County can vote. Yes. Hmm. Which is... And, is and, it's strange. Well, it's kind of different than like a local town board. Town boards, uh, you have just the people in the township that vote, 400 people or so, half of those are voters. Mm -hmm. They can vote for you. But in this particular thing, because it's broke up in, in districts, even though it's the district where I live at, District 4, the whole county 
population has hmm. to vote for it. I think that's a better way of doing it. I, I've studied political science, and they, we have a caucus system in Minnesota. There's only four states left that do that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it gets a little bit confusing, gets a little bit, uh, I don't want to say corrupt, but I mean it gets fewer people trying to influence each other instead of having a primary system. So I think the whole county voting, I think you get a better, a better vote. Well, all right. Best of luck with it. And like I say, we'll we'll follow up and uh, try to follow what you're doing, and we'll try and learn as well, so that we're better versed <laughs> as a state. It, it, there's no reason that yeah. uh, you know, especially with all the rural land in Minnesota and all the lakes and all the, yeah. I mean, water's a huge issue in this and it, state. It's an important mm. thing in this state, and if if. Washington D.C. or St. Paul is telling us what goes on in Houston County or <laughs> in, you know, and they are Minnesota or you know, it it it's, it just shouldn't be. I have several articles I wrote that's on my website, and I will continue to do that if I get elected to this position. Some of those projects that I'm talking about, or some of the mitigation stuff, I'll probably write short stories on it so that. Uh, the constituents out there can actually go and look at this. Now, you've wrote some things in the paper up there, too, haven't you, John? I have put in a newspaper uh, an ad each week. Oh, okay. Starting two weeks ago until after the election. And then right. the local paper from Morrison County actually announced my candidacy uh, two weeks ago. And the Brainerd Dispatch also put me in the voter's guide that they publish every year. Oh, great. Cool. So look for that stuff, get informed, and vote those races down the ticket, please. <laughs> yep. And yes. if you got any questions, call me. My phone number is on, the, on, a, on my website and on my Facebook page, on my business cards, on my lit, because I'm not afraid to talk to people. Well, there you go. He sure uh, has done a great job coming on here and talking to us. So thank you very much, John, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, gentlemen. Mm, good luck. Well, that, we learned a ton about stuff that, that, first of all, let me say, it's nice of you to, to join me for the closing this week. <laughs> well, you know, I am in demand, Jay. That's so, true. I mean, uh, sometimes I have to step out, but yes, I know with me interviewed David, I, <laughs> I uh, you know, had somewhere yeah, to be, I sorry, think. I just <laughs> giving you a hard time. It is rare that you fly solo. Yeah. That is rare. It is. In fact, you know, speaking of that. Yeah. I've said before that the day you quit, I ain't doing this either. Right. Okay. I'm not doing this show with anybody else or by myself or nothing. Um, so, and and just remember, do you, do you think, I mean, I never will do that on a permanent basis. Yeah. Do you think we'll ever have a guest host or somebody other than you or me Ooh. sit in one of these chairs? I don't know. Have to yes. be a pretty... Pretty severe thing for one of us to not be here. That's true. And that's kind of the nice thing about podcasting. I mean, we could... True. I mean, I went on my honeymoon and we recorded the show the day before I got married or whatever yeah. it was. So it was... <laughs> you want to know what I was doing the day before or two days before or whatever it was? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, that is the nice thing about podcasting. Yeah. You know, I've, I've got a, like a touch of laryngitis, but I'm still here, you know, and it's... But it, we do our yeah, civic duty no matter what. Well, hopefully true. not. Hopefully we don't have to go through that. I mean, you know, the post office, they say rain, snow, or shine, you'll get your mail. Well, it's the federal government that stinks. We're better than the post office. You'll get your podcast no matter what. That's true. I mean, very close to episode 100, by the way. We're getting there. We're getting there. We're in the 80s. So right. uh, we're, we've got we're, the in the, we're in turning. the Reagan years. <laughs> We've got the wheels turning. When we hit 100, what are we going to do to celebrate? It'll be, it'll be good. That's I don't know, but that. I'm thinking. I'm thinking, and I'm just spitballing this out loud. We ought to do. You ought to tape together somehow some of like our greatest moments or something. We ought to have like a highlight show. That might be a lot of work, but um, yeah. well, I, who cares? I don't have to do it. So I mean, <laughs> thanks, thanks. <laughs> Now you know who does the editing. Oh. Or the lack of. <laughs> well, what a great interview with John, though. I mean, he has so much knowledge on um, 
you know, the, the issues of, of water and soil con- uh, conservation. He's been doing it himself his whole life, farming his whole life. I think he's going to do great on that board and be a great r- voice for Morrison County. Absolutely. Well, and, and, and here's the thing. I mean. And he's willing to learn. Yeah. I mean, that's even more. That's good. That is good. You know, some people think they know everything. Um that's rarely the case. I mean, I, I say between you and I, we know everything, and you know. But you it, don't know everything I know, and I don't know everything you know. Right? If somebody asks me and I don't know, I just say that's something you know, and I send them your way. Uh, <laughs> so somehow we we come up with a BS answer that yeah. we think is right. Uh, but you know, this is a thing. I here in the cities, we we kind of get this mentality that. Uh, an urban suburban mentality where we're dealing with certain issues and we just kind of don't think about the way the rest of the state runs but most of the state i mean it's it's rural you know i mean we've got our cities our small towns but it is pretty rural minnesota i think is one of those states where there's always going to be an urban and rural divide yeah you know you just i mean it's just, it's kind of like you got New York City and you got the rest of New York. Right. <laughs> you, that's a very extreme differences there. Yeah. You know, but you look at a state like, you know, Wyoming or a state like Idaho and there's there's not a lot of urban areas. No. A couple big cities and that's it. So I think you're going to see that Minnesota. I think the seven county metro, I think, uh, is going to always be different than the rural. And that's okay. Um, there's nothing wrong with that, but it also just goes to show how you can't have a one-size-fits-all way of doing things. Things like soil and conservation need to be done at the county level, Yeah, and it's very important that that happens, that uh, we don't have some some bureaucrat uh, trying to make laws for everybody, that, that you can have some, like John said, you can have some general rules, but that ultimately the county, the people closest need to manage the problem the best right and i think nowhere in the is that more evident than in a a rural versus urban setting yeah well and like we said before i mean we got tons of water here yeah you know plenty of water to manage i mean so it's drive outside the seven county metro and you're going to see a lot of land being worked Yes, you are. And, you know, for those of you in, in Minneapolis, that means uh, you can't get there by bus or by light rail. <laughs> so, <laughs> or you, bicycle. Yeah, all you bikers. It would take still. a long time anyway. <laughs> there's, no there's no regional trail out to uh, Little Falls. Sorry. <laughs> Maybe you get to, like, Big Lake. That's about as far as you go. Yeah. No, no regional trails. I guess, I don't know. There's some of those state trails, I guess, but that's that's a lot of biking. Lucy Line one goes all the way out to Hutchinson, I think. Yeah, I think it does. Mm-hmm. So, all right. Well, it's late, so it's probably time we wrap this thing up. Another and, uh, beauty in the can. If you want to run, well, it's a little late. If you want to run for an office, if you're thinking about it down the line, though, and you know you you want to get more information around it you see things happening in your community you don't understand your uh, county that you don't understand you want some real world uh, help you know it's people who have done it people who have put butts in seats before right? we're your guys we've we've done it not only in crystal but we've done it around the metro and 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 we're we're helping people out state and we're helping people in the metro and we would like to help you we'd love to get your stories on uh, on our podcast or on our blog so get a hold of us c-o-m-m solutions m-n at gmail.com c-o-m-m solutions m-n at gmail.com share this stuff with your family and friends rate the podcast if you don't mind we would be indebted to you forever if you did that because <laughs> uh, that's only going to help get the word out and that's all we want to do and next time bring your voice I'm working on it. This has been like two weeks, man. I mean, and it feels worse than it did a week ago. I don't know what's going on. It's I don't know. You need a little orange juice and uh, a couple of days in front of the TV, I think, is what you need. Well, starting, what, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I've got a string of shows, so I'll be singing all week. So you're going to be singing with this voice. Yep. It's going to sound amazing. 
So come out and see my shows because <laughs> you get, you're gonna get the you got the son, Bob Dylan sonic voice experience here. Experience of a lifetime. <laughs> oh, gee. Uh, huh. With that, I'm going to stop talking. We're going to close this thing down. Uh, thank you guys so much. We love you. We want to help you get a hold of us. Uh, we do. We love you, Minnesota. Now it's your turn to get to work.